Um, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew today, Matthew, and we're going to be looking at Matthew, Matthew's view of the resurrection. I want to talk to you this morning about the resurrection. You say, well, Pastor Bill, what else are you going to talk about today? Listen, when I first came here, I'll give you a little secret. I was about as green as these flowers, the, the base of these flowers in front of when I first came here as a pastor and, and uh, you know, nervous, wanting to do well. So I'm studying this, that, and the other. So my first year here, I don't, you know, it must have been, it had to be my first, uh, hopefully it was my first one, hopefully it wasn't after that, but my first Palm Sunday. I get up and I preach the message that day, man, I'm preaching the message and, and I get finished and, you know, you know, young preacher and I'm in the back and, and so the lady comes back and she says to me, well, I was just hoping to get a message of Palm Sunday. I didn't even teach the Palm Sunday message that Sunday. Now, I know it was Bible I was teaching, but it's like, ooh, you know. So what I'm saying is uh, I learned a lesson then, I think, you know, obviously. But today is unlike any other day. Um, what we're coming together and celebrating today, it's called the resurrection. And why is it so important? Well, the Apostle Paul nailed it when he said this about the resurrection. He said, if there is no resurrection, we are to be pitied among all men. In other words, Christians, they ought to have pity on Christians if there's no resurrection. In other words, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, we're to be pitied. Why? Well, because what we're believing isn't true. That's the whole basis of our faith. And what was it? They were teaching in the first century. It wasn't just, it wasn't just, that Christ is on the cross, like he died on the cross. Well, we talked about that on Friday. It really happened. He died for our sins on that cross, but he's not on the cross anymore, right? He, after that, it says he was buried. And then came Sunday morning, Sunday morning. And I would say to you, what did they find? We're going to look at this now in chapter 28. They found an empty tomb, but we're, we're not just talking about an empty tomb. There had to be one of those, of course, but we're talking about a risen Savior. That's what the resurrection is. Here's what it means, resurrection. It is, you must be alive first, then you must die, right? Then you must come back to life and never die again. Let me say it one more time. You must be alive first. Number two, you must die Number, th number three, you must come back to life, and then you must be never die again. Four stages to that. There were people, right? Many people, by the way, that died on the cross. Many people died on the cross, right? So obviously Jesus was wholly different, but there were people, obviously, that were, first of all, they were alive. I mean, then they died on the cross, okay? Okay. Um, they were buried. And even some, Old Testament and New, they came back to life after they died. <laughs> you know, there were. Remember Lazarus? Lazarus, come forth, Jesus said. And out he comes from the grave after four days of being, being dead. And there were um, other places. Remember the guy? Don't, this, don't let this be you. He fell asleep in church during the message. All right? What happened to him? He fell out the window and died. Now, we're on the first floor, so that's not a good case. Happened. A couple of you sitting by the window, but even if you fell out the window, it wouldn't be that far. This guy died, fell asleep in church and died. What did they do? Paul goes downstairs. I mean, let's not interrupt the Bible study. Let's just go down here and pray for this guy, and he comes back to life. It's like, wow, that's a good, there, there's a good application, right, for the Bible study. This guy, they prayed over him, and he came back to life. Old Testament, we know there are cases where I remember the one with the prophet, the, the lady's son died. He goes upstairs and he lays on top of the body and prays and that, he came back to life. Now, what's the difference between the ones I just mentioned and Jesus? They died again. They died again. It was great that they got raised back to life. It's great that somebody gets healed from this, that, or the other, right? I love that. I pray for that all the time, but guess what? They're going to die again in the flesh, Right? Now, as a Christian, Jesus said, you know, you'll never die if you believe in me, because that means absent from the body, present with the Lord. But 
The fact of the matter is, is that these bodies will perish. But Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning he was the number one, that he died, he, he was alive, he died, he was buried, and then he came back to life, never to die again. Now that is the promise for the believer. And it is the cornerstone of our what, what we believe. It's everything, in other words. This day, what are... What it, it's everything for Christianity. It means everything, the resurrection. What's the, what are we really saying today? We are saying this, that Christ is alive. He's alive. He's alive, unlike any other religion. And there are many, and there have been through time, Christianity separates itself from every, every other religion in the, in the sense that it says that right now, the one who... Uh, is the cornerstone, which is Jesus, he's alive. He's not in the grave anywhere. You won't find his bones anywhere because he had a bodily resurrection. He is alive. Every other person you name, whoever they were, those religious people, they were great teachers, religious, wonderful men, they say, but they're all, they all died. Jesus is different than any other one. He is alive. So the question is, and we believe this, every year we get together and we celebrate this, don't we? And um, so the resurrection, we believe, and I know I'm preaching to the choir by and large here from the book of Matthew, but here's what I want to say to you. Is there any proof for the resurrection of Jesus? Is there any proof? Or are we just believing because the Bible says it? Is there any proof? In other words, when you're talking to someone about the resurrection, do you have anything to back it up with? Any physical proof to give? And the answer, of course, is yes. And we'll talk about some of that this morning. I want to first draw your attention to Matthew chapter 27, the end of chapter 27, verse 63, which will give us our first bit of proof. Matthew 27, starting in verse 63. Now, this is just to set what's going on here. This is the chief priests and the Pharisees. They're gathered together talking to Pontius Pilate about Jesus now, right? He's been crucified. He's died. They even say that. So those that believe, oh, he didn't really die on the cross. It was a swoon theory. He, he, he like was in a coma and then he came back. To, no, no, sorry. He died. They knew that. They jabbed him with the spear to prove that. Blood and water came out. He was dead on the cross. And now... Um, so we look at what's being said here in chapter 28, chapter 27, verse 63, Pharisee speaking, sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Now he's talking about, he's making, um, he's talking about the words of Jesus, that Jesus, what Jesus said. This idea of what Jesus said or what God says, very important. And that's what the Bible is, by the way. What God says. And I mentioned this, I think it was last week. Some of you have words of Christ in red in your Bibles, right? Some of you have that. Here's the truth of the matter. If it was theologically correct, everything in the Bible would be red, meaning that he is God and he, he wrote everything as well. Him and the Father are one. But the, this idea of the Bible. What about the Bible? Well, the Bible is predictive. It's full of proclamations that haven't happened yet. This particular one regarding the resurrection was predicted. It was mentioned in the Bible before it happened. And it matters. I'm going to read to you from Psalm 1610. This is a long before the resurrection. Psalm 1610, the words of David, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 16, Old Testament. It was prophesied or it was, it was spoken by David that there was going to be a time when the Messiah, did, he was going to die, but he wasn't going to be corrupt. He wasn't, his body was going to be resurrected. That's what that's talking about. And then, of course, New Testament, Matthew chapter 20, verse 18, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, 
and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify, and on the third day he will rise again. And then I just read you that portion from Matthew where they're, they were quoting what Jesus said, Matthew 27 there, and then Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Mark 10, 34, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Luke 18, 33, they will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Luke 24, 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. One more time, Luke 24, 46. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So the word of God has predicted Jesus' resurrection. In other words, it was spoken of before it happened. The Bible is different than any other book. And you probably have done some predictions. Some of you have spent maybe some time doing your bracket, right? Some of you are going, bracket? What's he talking about? Well, some of you are going, I know what he's talking about. Bracket, you know, that's the March madness. It's not quite as mad as it has been, right? Because there's no people. It's crazy. There's no people in the stands. Just a few pictures in this. I mean, it's crazy where we're at. But the point is, those of you that pick Gonzaga to, to win the final, they're in it now, right? Gonzaga and Baylor. But you pick, you get a bracket, and you pick which team's going to win. That's called a bracket. There's brackets laid out, and this and that and the other. You get to the end, and if you win, I guess you win a prize or something. But the point is, this idea of, of, of predicting, right? Predicting something. Well, most of you are going to get most of it wrong. I mean, if Jesus was in the business of doing this, he would win every year. He would predict everything that every person, you'd look at his prediction and it would be every, every year it would come best. That's the way the word of God is. It's never been wrong. You know, it's never been wrong. And it's predictive. Here's what John said regarding these predictions. The reason for them, one of the reasons for them, John 14, 29. And now I have told you before it comes that when it comes, when it comes to pass, you may believe. See, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So God tells us in advance things that are going to come to pass that will increase our faith. That's what he says. So the word of God is unlike any other book. It is a witness to the fact that the resurrection is true. But there's more than that. Because some of you say, well, you believe the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. Yeah, I would understand where people would say that. But then there's more. There's more. We'll get down to verse 1 of chapter 28 now. Verse 1 of chapter 28. I'm going to read the first 10 verses here. And this is point number two. So we got the first point is the word, the witness of the word. Now we get the witness of the I'm sorry, the witnesses, the witnesses, verse 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, that would be Saturday, as the first day of the week began to dawn, that would be Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he has gone before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy 
and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to, said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Notice the keys here. We're seeing this idea of the witnesses. What do witnesses do? They see things, right? Witnesses see things. They bear witness to things. And this is what, these are witnesses. And now these witnesses that are bearing witness to the resurrection actually saw, they saw a lot. Here's what these women saw, right? They saw the death of Jesus in Matthew 27, 56, as they're at the foot of the cross. Um, I'll just read 55, 27, 55, and 56. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there, looking on from afar, looking on at the cross, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So they were there. These women witnessed the death of Jesus on the cross and everything that led up to that. Then they were at the burial of Jesus. Matthew 27, 61, when Joseph of Arimathea had come and asked to have the body and he wrapped it in clean linen, it says in verse 60, he laid it in the tomb. And then verse 61 says, and Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. So the witnesses now, they see him die, they see him buried. And then we see in verse one of chapter 28 that they, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other came to see the tomb. Now we know from the other accounts in the gospels what they were there for. They weren't looking for the risen Christ. They were looking for the dead Jesus, right? They had burial spices, and they were going to take care of his body, his dead body, so it didn't stink. That was just a, that was the that was the the process that was done, and that's what they they were expectation when they went to the tomb. We see in other places they talked about how we're going to move the stone and all these things that the issues of life that they were dealing with, but they were witnesses. They were present at the death burial, and resurrection. Now, because as they were leaving the tomb, as they saw the earthquake, they, they experienced the earthquake, they saw the angel and all these other things, and it says they had um, great joy and, and fear at the same time, and then they, he says, go tell the other people. And so they left to bear witness of this event. Now, I want to say a couple of things to you, because some people say, yeah, that whole idea of the resurrection, it's a hoax. It was a hoax. It was a story, in other words, that some people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and some other people have come together and they made this elaborate hoax. And some will say, see, you can even see this hoax because if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, all the details aren't the same. Some people mention two, you know, and one angel, you know, about the stone being rolled back, this, that, and the other, the timing of that and, and everything else. And, and they look at that and say, because every single fact or every detail, I should say, is a little bit different. And here's what I would say to you. People that do investigations, people that listen to people's statements that are trained to do this, know something. They know this, that if you interview two people separately that saw the same event or took place in something, whether it be a crime or anything, and their account is exactly the same. Every detail is exactly the same. What they know about that is that that has been rehearsed. That's what they know. They're trained. They realize, oh, this is a little bit too cut and dry here. And that the flags go up when they see that. Because they realize that when two people see the same event, they won't exactly say it the same way. And they're even seeing different things. They can look at the same situation, a car accident, a car wreck, and, and give, you, give you different descriptions of what or how they saw it. But the thing we look at when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the details don't change. That Jesus Christ was put into that tomb and that the stone was rolled back. 
when they went. However, it got there. It was rolled back. And there was someone there, an angel. We, we see that and in, in, in that communicated the message to the women. They saw the empty tomb. That's, that's all, all the detail. All those particular facts are all the same. That's the most important facts. And that Jesus was seen alive. Very important. That he was seen alive. And let me tell you something. If you were trying to perpetuate a hoax, perpetrate a hoax, using women as your witnesses would not have been a good thing to do in the first century. Things aren't like they are. Things weren't then like they are today. Women couldn't even be used in a court of law to be a witness at that point in time. They, were, they wouldn't be credible witnesses necessarily in the first century. Right? That's the way things were then. So that even adds credence to the story that they would be the chief witnesses, the ones that saw him first and foremost. That adds credence to the story. It doesn't take it away from it in any way. But they weren't the only ones. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, 6, regarding witnesses. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen, there it is, he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also. That's the apostle Paul speaking. And last but not least, he was seen by me. I have seen him, 1 Corinthians 15, 6 through 8. There were many witnesses that saw Christ. Now, here's what I would say to you. Regarding the, the 12, where it ended up being the, the 10, let's say, because... Ten men, the apostles, died for their witness in Christ. In other words, they were martyred for the faith. Now think about that. Would you die for Jesus? Think about that. Would you die for Christ? That's not even the question this morning, though. That's one thing. And they did. Now, we know that John, uh, he, he lived to be a ripe old age. He wrote the book of Revelation from the Isle of Patmos. They try, Historically, they said they tried to Boil him in a cauldron of oil, and he survived. <laughs> God wasn't finished with him yet. He wrote the book of Revelation at the end of his life. But 10 of them, you know, we had Judas to be one of the 12, right? But then the 10, they all died one way, shape, or form for their faith in Christ. They went to their graves, took it to the grave. They would not, they, they would not um, renounce their faith in Christ. Now think about that for a moment. If you were telling a lie, if you hadn't seen the risen Christ. That really wasn't true. You just were kind of like starting a new religion. Maybe this would be cool. We can all get this thing, and, and it'll be a good living for some of us, or whatever the case is. And it wasn't really true. You weren't really sure about it. Would you die in that situation? Or would you at least say, you know, I'm not really sure about this. I, I just want to say when the chips were down, because that's what they wanted. Just recant. Just tell us that, that, that he isn't who he claims to be. And then you would get left off the hook, let off the hook. Well, they died for their faith in Christ. That is a witness that those 10 people, they, they died believing that this was true. Who would die for a hoax? I mean, Satan even knew it when he was dealing with Job. Skin for skin, what a man will give for his life when the chips are down, right? And that's true. Why would you die for something you didn't believe in? That would be ridiculous. Who would do that? Maybe a lunatic. There had to be, there could have been one lunatic. I, I don't know, but nine more? I mean, ten of them? Think about that. Of course not. That's a witness. The witnesses that saw him. Now, if that's not enough, there's more. Verses 11 through 15. Let's read that of chapter 28 of Matthew. Verses 11 through 15. Now, while they were going... Behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. All the things that happened. Remember, they were there when the women showed up. We just read the account. 
the earthquake, the stone rolled back, the man, the, the man that's the, the angel that's there. And, um, and so now this happens while they're on guard duty and Christ rises and it says that they went into the city and they reported what had happened to the chief priests. Verse 12, when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they were there. They get to see this miracle happen, take place. And they go in to tell someone. That, naturally, that's what you would have to do, right? When you were involved in that, how do you keep that to yourself? They're going to go and tell them. And, and then what happens? you got to be quiet. And then they offer you. You know, they say that everybody has their price, right? A large sum of money. What that ever would be, right? What's your large sum of money, whatever that would be. What's your price if you have one? Hopefully you don't have one. But, but here's what they told him. Basically, here's, here's the story, guys. This is the way it's going to be. You're going to get a large sum of money. And by the way, if those Roman guards, if they let a prisoner go, and that's what they did. They, they, for what they're, the story they're about to, to be a part of now, they could die for this. Serious. Here's what's being said. Um, here's what we want you. Here's the story, guys. Um, you tell them that the disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. Anybody ever been in the military? I've been told that if you fall asleep on guard duty during wartime, it used to be a death penalty. You could get that. That's what I was told. Um, it's serious business when you're on guard duty, right? Serious business. And in that time, that was the case. So that was a serious... To admit, to sign the paper. Yeah, I fell asleep on... We all fell asleep. That's serious. You could die for that. That's why they said, don't worry, verse 14. If it comes to the governor's ears that you guys fell asleep, we're going to appease him and make you secure. So you're trusting these people now to, to, to stand up for you, right? You're going to admit that you fell asleep on guard duty. And that's a lie. But anyway... It was more than that. It was the money, right? Verse 15 tells the whole story for them. So they took the money. They took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Well, shame on them. Soldiers, I thought they were people of integrity. They, they took the money and they lied. Shame on them. It says that this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now, he's talking about until the day this was written, of course, but I've been told that they still tell this story. But what about that story? This is the thing about the truth and a lie. You can examine a lie, and it will, it will fall apart. In this case, it certainly does. So what, does, what is the witness of the watchman? Because they attempted to cover the truth. This lie is self-refuting. Let's look at it. A couple of things. One, you got these professional soldiers. They all fell, not just one or two, they all fell asleep. And then you've got this big, large stone that's got to be rolled off out of the way to get to Jesus, to get the, the tomb open, right? To, to steal the body, if that were the case. I've got this closet in my house where I keep my clothes, right? And I have to enter this closet whenever I get dressed to get my clothes out of there. And I'm an early riser. I get up super early. Um, I'm not boasting on that. I'm getting old. That's what happens when you get old. You can't sleep anymore. But I, so I, I get up early, and I'm always trying to be quiet that I don't wake my wife up, you know? And that door, man, that door, I can get it open, right? But then when I go to, it makes this noise. I got, I know you're saying, Pastor Bill, why don't you oil the thing? I'm going to. Believe me, after this, ser after this sermon, I will do it. But it's loud, and I'm thinking, oh, that's going to wake her up. So and I don't think that it does. She never complained about it. But if there were, let's say, 10 people there, some people, some of you sleep so light, everything wakes you up, right? Some people sleep lighter than others. So you're telling me that if they were on the stand now, the, 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 in, in the, the uh, cross-examination, so you were sleeping. 
That's your story. You were all asleep. All 10 of you. How many ever? And you saw the size of that stone. Pretty big stone, right? Real heavy stone. So you're telling me that that stone was actually rolled away and you didn't wake up at all. Nobody woke up. Not one of you. Just, it just takes one of 10 to wake up with that noise. Not one of you is a light sleeper. All of you slept through the whole thing. The stone being rolled away. You're sticking to that story. Okay? All right. And then he says, well, um, let me just ask you. So you're saying then that um, you were sleeping. While you were sleeping, the disciples stole the body away. Is that your story? Yeah, that's our story. That's our story. Okay. So the stone woke nobody up. Is that right? You already said that. Nobody woke up when the stone got moved. No, we slept through the whole thing. Okay, so then... Uh, just one question for you then. If you were sleeping and you didn't wake up, how did you know it was disciples that stole the body? How did you know while you were sleeping that it was disciples that stole the body? Oh, well, yeah. So you see, self-refuting, that, that lie is self-refuting. It still speaks today. It's still a witness today. That lie that the watchman told that, in fact, the body was stolen away. Now, if that weren't enough, and that's a lie, they took the money and ran. But we get to verse, verses 16 through 20, and this is more personal. Some of this stuff we're saying is long ago and far away, right? These people we're talking about. But I want to just bring it a little bit closer now because we're in this category. Hopefully you're in this category today right here. Verses 16 through 20. And the fourth point is, you know, the fourth witness, because we had the word, the witnesses, the watchmen. Now we're going to talk about the worshipers. Verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped. When they saw him, they worshiped him. That's what a worshiper does. And said, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Listen, the fact that we are here today. Now, I don't know why you're here. I hope you're here for the same reason I am. To celebrate the risen Savior, right? That he's alive. But you know that we're not alone in this. This is happening all around the world. You realize that people are getting together and they're, they're, they are celebrating that Jesus Christ is alive. They're celebrating the fact that he is alive. Now, this has been going on for a long time. One of the things it's spoken about in the, in the um, I don't know if it's Gam Gamaliel, yeah, he was talking, they were trying to snuff out Christianity, find ways to do that. And here's what, the, here's what this wise man came up with. And he wasn't a believer in Jesus. He said, you know, guys, we've had this happen in the past. There's been a, somebody, a leader that comes up, raised up. People are following him. And once he dies, once he gets killed, it's all over. They stop. It's all gone. It's all gone. And he names two different people who, that, who those uprisings happened with. And they died, and that was the end of it. Now, Jesus died, and I would ask you, here we are 2,000 years later. It's not the end of it. Just the opposite of that. We are here looking back at something that happened 2,000 years ago, and we're believing in our hearts that it's true. It's because the only thing that makes sense is that he is, in fact, alive. So this has been going on for 2,000 years, and there's no indication that it's, you know, there's ebbs and, and flows, I guess, but there's no indication that this thing's going to dry up, right? But the other thing, and, and keep it personal, when it comes to worshipers, the changed life, I would ask you a question if you're a believer. By the way, today's my wife's birthday. She's 50 today. 50 years in the Lord today. She received Jesus on an Easter Sunday many years ago. And um, 
and her life has changed as a result. It's not just that you pray a prayer and then you think, oh, you check that box in your mind. If that's all it is with you and Jesus, there's a problem. Just a checking of a box or a showing up in a building. It needs to be, there needs to be involved as time goes by, a changed life. Now think about it. This is personal now, right? Now we can see if your life changes from the outside, but you, only you know for sure what, how you've changed, right? How Christ has affected you. Because this is the worshipers, the actual worshiper and the changing of the worshiper's life is a witness to the idea that Christ is love. You're, so your changed life um, speaks volumes. Listen, when you get up on a Sunday morning and you leave your house at a certain time every Sunday morning, and you got your Bible tucked under your arm, you're going out. You, some of you have to take the kids and everything else that goes with it. It's a, it's a lot of work. But on a Sunday morning when you could be sleeping, you could be doing whatever else, that is a witness to your neighbors. They're watching. They're seeing that you're doing this. You're going to, because you're a worshiper of Jesus Christ, and, and on the first day of the week, they gather together to worship him. So your changed life matters. But I want to give you the the most, I was going to say probably, no, not probably, the most important witness. And they're all connected, but it's found in verse 20, the last verse of this chapter. This is what I want to show you. Look at this. He says, after he says, go therefore in 19 and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's not the part I'm talking about. This is the part right here. He says, and lo, I am with, they don't talk like that anymore, but and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This idea of the worshiper in Jesus Christ, the born again Christian has the very presence of God in his life. That is everything. If he's alive, if he's real, then he makes himself manifest to his people. This is what changes you. The presence of God, the very presence of God. This is what worship is, where two or more gathered in his name. There he is in the midst right now. Although we can't see him, he is here. Because the promise is in the word that we're two or more gathered. There he is in the midst now, here's what I want to say to you. As a result of his presence in your life as a believer, you may have something that you, I do sometimes, take for granted. What is it? Well, what comes with his presence? Well, the peace that he brings, because he's the Prince of Peace. When you have his presence, you have peace. Do you remember that in the days when you didn't have it? Your whole life is in turmoil. Even if you were on the outside, you had things under control. The inside, man, it was, it was out of control, very much out of control. And you may have been looking like a lot of people are for peace in all the wrong places. Maybe peace in a person, peace in a political party, you know, peace, you know, some people are looking for comfort, Southern comfort, that idea, you know, they're looking for that peace in all the wrong places, medicate, trying to medicate themselves, whatever the case would be, to find this elusive, seemingly elusive peace. Who doesn't like peace, right? Everyone likes that. We like peace and quiet. But Jesus brings peace to a person's life, not just the idea of Jesus. Jesus himself. And when he comes into the room, there is just like, peace in there. And when he comes into a life, man, there is peace. Do you remember that? I remember in my mind, it's like this. I, re I felt like a weight had been lifted off of me. Like somebody had taken a physical weight and I think well, it's my sins, you know, taken away or whatever it was. I, I just know that it was a peace had filled and flooded my heart. And, and we can we have that peace in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of, of a country that's going down the tube seemingly. We can have the peace that surpasses understanding because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the one, remember, 
He calms the wind and the waves. Remember their disciples? Serious fishermen, professionals. They've been in all kinds of situations out on the water. Come on, that's what, when you're a fisherman. They're one day out and Jesus is sleeping in a boat. And man, the, the wind and the wave comes up and they're, they, they, they're to the point where we're dying, man. This is it. Wake him up. Doesn't he care? We're going to perish. We're going to perish. He wakes up and, he, and he's looking at them and he goes, peace, be still. And it just, it just stopped. Everything just got smooth. And that's the way it is with Jesus. I mean, it's just, a, I'm not saying your life can be smooth. I'm saying your countenance, your, your heart can have that, can have that, be that, that place even keeled, if you want to call it that. But the Prince of Peace, he calms the wind and the waves. He does that in each one of our lives. See, sometimes we view the world and we just think, well, they have that too. No, they don't have that. They don't have that. That's a witness to the world. I'm a firm believer. Some people say, every Christian can be healed. I don't believe that. Scriptures don't teach that. We can pray for healing. He heals some, but some he doesn't. Some they have to suffer. Some they die. Right? They, you know, but the point is, I believe the reason we go to the hospital is so we can minister to those health care givers. They get to see somebody a little different. They're not as worried about dying or this or that. You know what I'm saying? They have the peace that surpasses understanding. That's attractive. You know, Bitcoin is going for, I saw a thing where bit, three quarters of one Bitcoin, 50 some thousand dollars. Wow, it's Bitcoin's going up. Get your Bitcoin, right? But the peace that surpasses understanding, priceless. You can't put a price on it. You can't. It's priceless. Jesus said this in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And this is the peace that only Jesus can bring. When we get our eyes off of Jesus as believers, we lose our peace. Right? and we keep our eyes on him, we'll have our peace. There's no guarantee that we're not gonna go through hard things as Christians, but we can have peace as we go through. That's the guarantee, that we can have peace no matter what, because the Prince of Peace is always available to us, his presence, he's with us. He promises I'll never ever leave you. Jesus is offering that peace to you today, to us today. There may be some of us that don't know Christ, that are searching for peace in all the wrong places, that are placed in their life where they're in turmoil. It's the opposite of peace. You know, there's a lot of things that we talk about in the world. Anxiety, for example. A lot of, you hear a lot about that. Anxiety. What is that? Depression. What is that? That is a lack of peace. Think about that. Think it through. You know, we've all had those, but there's no peace in those things, right? What's lacking is peace in those things and many others, right? The Prince of Peace can bring that to all of us. It is available to, to whosoever will. Well, listen, here's what I would say to you. This we're talking about right now, the peace of God, right? And you cannot have the peace of God unless you have peace with God. It starts there. If you don't have peace with God, you can't have the peace of God. What do I mean by that? Peace with God. Here's what I mean. The Bible says that, that all have sinned and fallen short of, of the glory of God. And that means that people are at enmity or at war with God. Everyone that's born is at war with God. And, and the only thing to do when you're at war with God, there's only one answer, and that is to surrender. Put up the white flag. I surrender, right? You've heard the song, I surrender all. That guy, he learned it. Right? We all need to learn that. It's about surrendering to him. Surrendering what? Surrendering your life. Just laying it down at his feet. Because you need to have peace with God before you can experience the peace of God. Now, that's a first time thing if you've never come to Christ. Of how do you get peace with God? You ask Christ to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. You might say, well, I've already done that, but I just don't have the peace... Because I've walked away, I've done this or that or the other. He's calling you back today to 
put, to put the white flag, surrender, just surrender today. It's the same prayer. He's offering you the peace that surpasses understanding today. And it needs to be received. To as many as received him, to those he gives the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now, we're going to pray now. We're just about finished. I'm going to pray, and here's how I'm going to pray. I'm going to give anybody a chance, an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into their lives today, to surrender to God, to have peace with God today so they can have the peace of God today. If, that's, if that is anyone within earshot, I'm going to give you a chance to do that. I'm going to also pray for the church. Those of you that have peace with God, you've surrendered to the Lord, but maybe there's something going on and, and you're, you're anxious, whatever the case is, and you're, you're not experiencing his peace today. He's calling you back to that place. He wants you to let you know today that he's with you. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. We believe it's true. We believe there is proof of the resurrection. We'll only believe. Lord, we want to pray for anybody here today that has not placed their full trust in you in their lives yet. Or maybe that would be coming back to you. We pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. And if that's you this morning, if you want to have the gift of forgiveness of all your sin, if you want to have the peace that surpasses all understanding, if you want to have peace with God today, pray this prayer and mean it in your heart and God will hear you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. I believe that he died, I believe that he was buried, and I believe he rose again. Jesus, I believe you're alive. Will you come into my life today? Will you forgive me of my sins today? Lord, I turn to you today with all my heart, and I surrender to you today, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we pray for your church. We pray for those whether I've known you for 50 years or five months. We pray, Lord, that we would experience your presence in a powerful way today because you're alive. You've risen from the dead, never to die again. And we commit our hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I would like to have five minutes of your time. I want you, we're going to hear something from a friend who has been here in times past. Well, because of the pandemic, this is what we have to do today. That's all. It's, and they've got a, just a short uh, encouragement to us and a song that I want, us, I want us to just sit and meditate on this, on this sweet song. It'll kind of back up what I just said, that last point, but just sit and think on uh, the words of this song and all that Jesus means. It, I think this, man, first time I heard this song, I was teaching a Bible study at Costa Mesa years back. And Sherry was, uh, I gave away who it is, but Sherry was visiting there and I just grabbed her. Can you do, I heard she did, can you do the worship for our Bible study? She came in and sang this song and I just, I didn't know how to describe it, but man, it's just like God was all over us when, when she sang that song. So here's the song.